<laughs> Strict diets, hours in the gym, a profound fixation on one's own body. This is hot! Sometimes, to the point of obsession. It gradually becomes more and more elaborated until it goes off the edge into something which we would consider as in psychiatry to be frankly uh, pathological behavior. What does it take for a woman to turn her body into this? 45, 55, 65, 75, 85, 105 pounds. <laughs> and how far will some women go to achieve it? I would be naive uh, to, to say that steroids doesn't exist in women's bodybuilding. It's more than a sport, it's a compulsion. They can't help themselves. They're hooked. I'm gonna leave my for that. Guys respect me and fear me. <laughs> My name is Christy Hawkins. I just won the MPC National Women's Bodybuilding Championship, um, the light heavyweight class and the overall, and so I earned my pro card. 27-year-old Christy Hawkins of Pasadena, California is five foot three and solid as a rock. Her biceps are the size of some women's thighs. She can bench press 225 pounds. That's the weight of Derek Jeter, plus 30. She can squat around 350. That's heavier than Shaquille O'Neal. In the world of bodybuilding, Christy is the it girl of the moment. Since she was 17, Christy competed as an amateur bodybuilder. In November 2007, she made it to the professional level by winning a top amateur competition. There are only about 85 professional female bodybuilders in the organization she's joined, the International Federation of Bodybuilders. Christy is now proud to be one of them. You put so much sacrifice into it, so much discipline and dedication, and you never think that you would reach that level. No rest for the weary. A lot of times I do train seven days a week. I'm in here doing something, um, ideally five or six, and you should take a day off, but I have excellent recovery abilities, so I don't feel right if I don't train. You know, I have a trunk full of books that I've read during cardio, literally a trunk full. To fully understand the mentality of the female bodybuilder, a key question is always, what got her into the gym in the first place? In Christy's case, it was a devastating eating disorder she struggled with throughout her adolescence. I remember being very heavy in elementary school. You know, I took dance lessons and I was a twirler and everything, but I think I just wasn't active enough and didn't have proper eating habits. I was suffered from anorexia. That kind of led me to starve myself in an effort to be skinny. So at the time, that was my ideal of beautiful, supermodel thin. Gosh, I remember weighing like 70 or 75 pounds. But then something changed dramatically. Christy discovered the gym, first cardio, then weight training. Initially, she worked out just to burn more calories. Over time, her body started to change, and Christy liked what she was seeing. At 15, she got her own gym membership. By 17, she was competing as an amateur bodybuilder. Food, once the enemy, now became essential. Now a PhD candidate in chemical engineering at Caltech, Christy sees that the gym was just a different way of channeling her disorder. You can look at bodybuilding as another form of disordered eating, and I think a lot of bodybuilders probably have issues with food. I think a lot of it has to do with control. You want to eat certain things and see the resultant changes in your physique. It's not normal to most people, but I feel like it is a healthy lifestyle and a healthy outlet. Um, for me to be able to address those issues. In psychiatry, the magic words that we use to define the threshold of what is a, an illness or a disorder is if it seriously impairs social or occupational functioning or if it causes serious subjective distress. 
Dr. Harrison Pope is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, based out of Harvard's McLean Hospital. He's published several studies of bodybuilders. What he found? A high prevalence of eating and other psychiatric disorders, including one he calls muscle dysmorphia. Muscle dysmorphia is a syndrome in which individuals develop an unrealistic preoccupation with their muscularity or fitness. The typical individual with muscle dysmorphia will look into the mirror and see themselves as small and frail, even though they are actually big and muscular. Bodybuilders often refer to muscle dysmorphia colloquially as bigorexia. That's it for weight. Okay, good. It's a good little workout. <laughs> With today's workout behind her, Christy is about to strike a pose. Can we take pictures over here real quick? Or? Now that she's gone pro, Christy has been invited to compete in one of the industry's most prestigious pro contests of the year, Miss International. She's one of only 16 women in the world who made the cut this year. With the show just 13 weeks away, she needs to scrutinize her physical development She'll send these photos off to her nutritionist, who lives in New York, to be critiqued. Kind of gives me a second set of eyes um, to make sure that, you know, I'm dialed in on time for my competition. Having suffered from anorexia, it's taken Christy time to embrace having a body like this. So is this beautiful? It's all in the eye of the beholder. This morning I was at the gym and an older lady made a comment about another trainer in the gym that her biceps were so big and that she was, quote, crazy. And I told her that my biceps were twice that size and she didn't believe me until I took off my sweatshirt. She asked if I was married and then she said that no man would want to marry me looking like that. And I told her that that was not true, <laughs> that I had them lined up. At the moment, Christy's dating a male bodybuilder and she's not the least bit self-conscious about her body. She loves her muscles and says they have never gotten in the way of a relationship. The strict diet and the training regimen, on the other hand, have. Dating a bodybuilder who's equally hooked on muscles sure makes things easier. Coming up next, do they or don't they? Tackling the prickly subject of steroids. I would be naive to say that steroids doesn't exist in women's bodybuilding. I consider myself a New York girl all the way, man. I love that city. Me and my bicycle, we knew that city very well. However, me and my SLK, we know Long Island very well now, too, let me tell you. Oh, God. 33-year-old Colette Nelson has been living and breathing bodybuilding since she was 19. She's hopelessly hooked on the sport and the psychic rewards she says she gets from it. One thing she's learned along the way, few arrive at bodybuilding without some degree of emotional baggage they're trying to overcome or overcompensate for. Hers, being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at age 12. We're at the pharmacy picking up all my, actually diabetes medication, <laughs> all my insulin. Yep, Himalin Regular, Lantus, Novolog, and Simlin, right? Yes. Okay. That's $120. It's me, my mom, and the doctor, you know, at like 9 o'clock at night on like a Wednesday. And he tries to draw my blood. So I'm sitting here, you know, trying to draw my blood, and they can't get, they can't do it. Because there's so much glucose going through my veins that the, 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 the vein just keeps snapping. Finally, takes the blood, and uh, tears are coming out of the doctor's eyes. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a kid. I just can't even believe my mom looks like she's going to cry. He's crying, and, and now we're just all like, yeah, I mean, I'm knowing something's bad. So he comes back and he's like, we're going to have to start your daughter on insulin tonight. Colette's doctors told her she had to exercise to keep her blood sugar under control, so she hit the gym. The results were positive, and Colette regained a sense of power and control over her illness and her body. In high school, she became obsessed with exercise, teaching up to 20 aerobics classes a week. Then in college, she gravitated into the weight room where she fell in love with bodybuilding. I went from 120 pounds, like my freshman year, and I came back in that summer, and I was like 145. 
my parents were like, oh my God. I was kind of this, you know, little thing dancing around, teaching aerobics, and all of a sudden I'm like, I, I want to be a bodybuilder. At 26, Colette began competing as an amateur, and in 2004, she turned professional with the International Federation of Bodybuilders. Along the way, Colette kept her diabetes a closely guarded secret. I would go into the bathroom, I would test my blood sugar. Nobody knew. I told nobody. I just don't want a judgment call. I don't want somebody to say those words to me, that maybe you shouldn't compete because you have diabetes. Competing is hard enough without having diabetes, but sticking to the highly regimented diet required of a bodybuilder while taking insulin to manage blood sugar, that adds a whole new challenge. The flounder looks good today. Is it good? Oh my God, this is my favorite. I live off flounder. Insulin tends to make diabetics appear bloated, a big problem for someone whose currency is her body. There it is. But Colette has no patience for naysayers. Thank you. Today she's a certified diabetes educator and a nutritionist. She's also made a name for herself as a pro bodybuilder and is in training for the Miss International competition. She'll be going up against her friend Christy Hawkins in just 11 weeks. Okay, ready? Colette's workout partner today is her fiance, retired bodybuilder Dave Jumbo Palumbo. This is the one and only my fiance, Dave Palumbo. I consider him a very lucky guy. While some might consider female bodybuilders to be masculine, Colette fully embraces her femininity to the point where she's had breast implants to counteract the effects of intense weightlifting. I'm a total girl, you know, it's pathetic, you know. I, like I said, I play no sports. I mean, I, I, I do my own nails. I'm into hair, makeup, and flash, and fashion. I mean, I'm just a total girl that likes to lift weights. So what, you know what I mean? <sighs> and being a girl in this industry, says Colette, is not easy. Women train much harder than men. We have to try so much harder for everything. We have to work so much harder for every ounce of muscle. I don't think they train harder. I think that they train with, with more ferocity yeah, because, they're so, because they think that they have something to prove. <sighs> with the Miss International just a few weeks away, Colette has two major obstacles. She has to drop about 25 pounds quickly, which can be dangerous if done without proper medical guidance. And she's nursing a tear in her left shoulder, a potentially career-threatening injury. Give me a kiss. Love one. Mwah. All right, see you back at the ranch. After her workout, Colette heads over to her physical therapist, Dr. Michael Camp. And there's Mike right now. <laughs> He's my god. <laughs> Good. Go. Too hard. Nope. People don't realize the wear and tear on the ligaments, the joints, the tendons, everything gets beaten down, especially when you're lifting heavy weights repetitively every day, two hours a day in the gym, a lot of wear and tear on the body. Why put her body through all this pain? Because Colette is way too hooked on bodybuilding and muscles to stop. Dr. Harrison Pope of Harvard's McLean Hospital says it all plays into the obsession shared by many female bodybuilders. When individuals have a very regular workout regimen and then they sustain an injury and then they just can't wait to get back to working out, one can't help but suspect that that workout regimen is having some sort of a psychiatrically protective effect for them. It may be that when they get the injury they consciously or unconsciously realize that if they allow their working out to lapse for too long that bad things may start to happen and so it may be that their instincts are to get back into the workout regimen as quickly as possible, even if it is a risk to do so. When we come back, a lie detector test at a bodybuilding competition, standard operating procedure for one organization. Are you attempting to lie to any of the questions we are going to review? No. And how far will some women go to get their bodies to look like this?
Being a good bodybuilder requires discipline and hard work. Many assume it requires something else. Performance enhancing drugs, steroids, the black cloud hanging over this industry. Not all professional female bodybuilders have to face a firestorm of questions. They do have a choice in the matter. 35-year-old attorney Teresita Morales is a professional bodybuilder, but she opted to go with a league that prides itself on drug testing all athletes before all shows. It's the World Natural Bodybuilding Federation, the WNBF and their biggest show of the year is coming up in just a couple days. Carrie's one of the competitors, and she's on her way in to get drug tested. If there's any evidence she's done steroids or any other performance enhancing drug, she's out for seven years. You can't compete forever, and I think a lot of times um, you really have to be very selective with what you use and put into your body. So I look uh, for things that won't give any long-term effects, so you go with the natural way, obviously and you don't have to worry about things like that. It's a simple message. We create a level playing field for athletes to compete in. You're natural, you want to compete on a level playing field where everybody's tested and treated equally, that's us. Aside from the drug test, today is also the weigh-in. That's the part that has Terry nervous. She's had to drop a couple of pounds in the last 24 hours to make her desired weight class, and that has taken its toll. Just a little under the weather. If Terry can come in under 118, she'll make lightweight, which would put her up against women her own size. If she comes in over 118, she'll end up a middleweight, not exactly a level playing field for her. I'm always a lightweight, and I think that day I was a little bit fearful of not making my weight. So, you know, you do the things that you have to do in order to, you know, see to it that you make your weight by, you know, whatever time your drug test is and your weighing is. Can you talk about those things that you do? Um, no, not really, but, um, you know, a lot of it's just not good for your body, and anyone can tell you that, um, you know, but you do what you have to do in order to get there. Dr. Harrison Pope of Harvard Medical School, who has studied female bodybuilders for years, found that many of his subjects used diuretics to drop weight, which can be extremely harmful to the kidneys, even fatal. It's a risk some bodybuilders are willing to take. That's how hooked they can get. If you take a diuretic so that you are dehydrated, all of the definition of the muscles on the surface of the skin is greatly enhanced. In order to get the, quote, cut-up appearance that bodybuilders seek, um, a stiff dose of a diuretic will possibly mean the difference between winning and losing. As perfectly tuned an instrument as Terry's body is, it may not be so perfect after all. She's feeling sick, having dropped too much water weight too fast. Not uncommon in the world of professional bodybuilding. I was a wreck. <laughs> yeah, I was a wreck. I was in a lot of pain. It's all warm in here. Right? It's warm. From time to time, one hears of fatalities where someone is found dead in a motel room an hour prior to uh, the time of a bodybuilding competition. And very often, those acute deaths are attributable to a miscalculation on diuretics. The WNBF's drug testing consists of a urine test, which is highly accurate, but there are ways around it. To complement the urine test, there's also a mandatory lie detector test, though that's only about 90% accurate. Okay, question number one is your first name Teresita? Yes. It's not, as far as whether or not I'm going to pass or fail it, that's not, I don't worry about that. Are you attempting to lie to any of the questions we are going to review? No. It's just, I guess, when you're sitting there in a chair with all of this equipment attached to your body and you really can't see um, the person that's asking you the questions, I guess it's just a little nerve-wracking because it's so quiet in that room. And you pass. Excellent. <laughs> we just completed the polygraph and I need to get weighed and then do my, my urine test, but I still don't have the urge. So I think I'm gonna wait a little while for that. Finally, nature calls. Yeah, 
The other major professional bodybuilding organization, the IFBB, International Federation of Bodybuilders, does not routinely drug test its athletes. Christy and Colette are both IFBB pros. They don't like talking about steroids. No one in this industry does. We asked anyway. What's unfortunate in today's political environment is that if you are breaking Olympic records, if you are hitting too many home runs, if you're a woman who's decided to build up their body, you must be taking steroids. You must be. I think it's prevalent in every sport, but with us, it's just more obvious. Steve Winterstrom, a longtime supporter of female bodybuilding, is editor-in-chief of Women's Physique World and historian for the IFBB. He says when it comes to performance-enhancing drugs, bodybuilders are no different than any other type of athlete. I would be naive uh, to, to say that steroids doesn't exist in women's bodybuilding. Any sport where you ask an athlete to try to achieve an ultimate, they're going to look for every edge. And uh, just as it is in every sport, not every single woman bodybuilder is taking steroids. People don't realize how many hours a day we spend in the gym, how much protein we consume to build muscle. And, you know, it's a very slow process. Um, if you just put on a couple pounds a year, you know, 10 years down the line, you're going to have 20 pounds more muscle, which is a tremendous amount for a female frame. So what's the bottom line? Are they or aren't they? The answer is, we don't know. We didn't see any women injecting steroids, and certainly no one would admit to taking them in today's political climate, especially not to us. What we do know is the prize money in the IFBB is substantially higher, up to $30,000 for a win, as opposed to the WNBF's 2000 We know there seems to be a difference in muscularity between the two leagues, and we know steroids can be hazardous to one's health, but some are still willing to take the risk for the sport they can't live without. I've heard a story where a group of athletes were asked if they were given a drug that would guarantee a gold medal in the Olympics, but it would also guarantee that they would die after exactly five years, would they take the drug? And surprisingly, a large percentage of athletes answered yes, that they would take the drug. Perhaps there is some basic instinct which drives people to accept these very high risks uh, when they get into that level of competition. So again, do they or don't they? That's something only the women themselves know, and maybe we never will. When we come back, what's the real key to being a successful bodybuilder? Sticking to a diet most would find impossible. I went to my best friend's uh, wedding in Texas and I took 101 pieces of chicken on the plane with me to the hotel. All right, how am I gonna carry all this? It's five o'clock on a cold Wednesday morning in Queens, New York. This is my lunch pail with about three meals in it. I have my gallon of water. Terry Morales is on her way to the gym, her daily ritual. And I am all set to go. And there is that morning paper route guy. <laughs> so we always meet each other in the morning. This will be Terry's last workout before her big competition this weekend. Today, she'll focus on arms, biceps, and triceps. In some ways, the gym is the most comforting place she could be after teenage years filled with turbulence and tragedy. As a young teen, Terry cared for her sick mother, who was suffering from cancer. She died when Terry was a junior in high school. Losing her was like my biggest loss ever. And um, you know, you have like deaths in the family and you lose friends and things happen like in your life, but there's nothing like losing a mother. And you can never compare any hurt that you feel um, to losing a mother. It was really difficult. Terry ended up in foster care and her experience led her to become an attorney representing children in the New York City foster care system. She immerses herself as much into her work as she does into working out. 
one client of mine said, you know what, I, I think you exercise a lot for, for a particular reason. And then I asked her what the reason was, and she said, um, because exercise won't disappoint you, because the gym will always be there. In a psychological sense, I think she hit it right on the nail. I think that in many cases, for both women and men, the ritual of going to the gym and working out hard has a clear psychiatric therapeutic benefit. It may be that, that in many of these cases, individuals are self-treating an underlying depression or are protecting themselves against a depression that might otherwise erupt. Hi. Hi, Terry. How are you? Good. Two days before Terry's competition, she's doing last-minute errands, tanning, buying a costume for her dance routine. Can I try on, on this outfit right here, the chain bra and the chain skirt? And getting her hair and nails done. Muscles aren't all that matter in a bodybuilding competition. It's about the whole package. It's definitely like a full-time job. The commitment has to be a 24-hour commitment. Sometimes other things in your life definitely get sacrificed because of this. I mean, if you're going for the win and you're going for the exposure and you're going for the endorsements and you're really trying to land those types of goals, then yes, it becomes a little bit intense and neurotic. <laughs> in between errands, Terry stops off to eat. More important than sleep and even exercise is diet. Most bodybuilders say it's at least 80% of the equation in being successful at what they do. That means micromanaging every crumb that goes into their mouths, down to a science most people can't comprehend. Here's the level of sacrifice female bodybuilders make for the sport they love. I went to my best friend's uh, wedding in Texas and I took 101 pieces of chicken on the plane uh, with me to the hotel. Uh, I, I froze it the night before and it lasted for about maybe four to four days, four to five days. Um, and I had to like bring my own water down there and I had tuna and I just made all of my meals when I went to the wedding. What I crave right now, um, peanut butter and, and crackers. Just uh, sitting down with some like Ritz crackers and some creamy peanut butter. <laughs> The micromanagement of diet is a typical obsessional symptom, and it begins, perhaps, as a rational plan in order to be able to lose weight and manage calories. But very often, it goes off the edge into something which we would consider pathological behavior to the point that it actually impairs the individual's social and occupational functioning. Very often, these women would describe to us that they would decline invitations to go to a restaurant, to a social gathering, to some other place, simply because they could not tolerate the possibility of deviating from their diet or deviating from some aspect of their exercise plan. In just a few weeks, Christy Hawkins will head to Columbus, Ohio for her contest, the Miss International. Today, she's posing for photographer Bill Dobbins for his website, BillDobbins.com. A recovered anorexic, Christy still maintains tight control over what she puts into her body. Put this knee down. What could she go for right now? A burger and fries. But she won't. It's just not worth it. Discipline, sacrifice, willpower. That's what being a female bodybuilder is all about. Now look at me with your eyes. I put so much work into it that I'm very proud of what I've accomplished and um, the way I look. I like the power that it represents, the strength, and um, I just think it's very attractive. Um, you know, the human body is amazing, and to look like an anatomy chart, I think it's pretty cool. When we come back, Game 40, we got 20 minutes. months at the gym, and it all boils down to just a few short minutes on the stage. This is a symmetry round, most muscular. The moment all bodybuilders live for. <laughs> After months of intense training and dieting, it's finally time for the big event, the WNBF World Championships. Show day. The most important part of the show is the pre-judging or posing on stage for a panel of judges. 
Doing well here provides validation for this extreme lifestyle. Terry's here and she's not in the mood to chat. At the drug test yesterday, all the athletes hid the goods under layers of clothing. Today, they're strutting their stuff. And it's a little intimidating. Despite the fact that I try not to, you know, focus on anything else around me, you do. And you you, you sneak a look and you, you take a look at the competition. I think that I, I didn't look as good as I, I could have. And I think I kind of knew that before I hit the stage. I think that that kind of got the best of me, yeah. It's extremely common for bodybuilders to hide their bodies until and unless they're on stage. Dr. Harrison Pope, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, has a unique insight on that phenomenon. Often, with the women who came to us in the course of our study of, of female bodybuilders, the woman would apologize for her current appearance and would immediately produce a series of photographs of herself on stage at the time of a competition and would turn and say, this is not me. And then show us the picture and say, this is me. We have even seen cases of individuals who were reluctant to suntan for fear that a plane flying overhead might notice them looking down. Finally, showtime. Some of the women get their pumps in right up to the last second. The first group that we're going to be doing in this drug tested event, all athletes, seven years drug tested, uh, polygraph and urinalysis here in the pros. The first group to take the stage, the lightweight women. Terry is so modest about her body, she avoids going to the beach. And yet here she is on the stage under harsh lights in front of an audience in a bikini. When you're hooked, sometimes you have to put your own insecurities aside for the sake of the sport. Not only do they look at your, your physique, but your stage performance. Relax, face front. How you um, just, I guess, portray your body. I don't go to the beach in the summer, and if I do, I wear shorts. I don't dress, you know, very revealing in general. My, my skirts are always knee high. So that was the toughest thing for me. Because I remember my first show in Poughkeepsie, I was really embarrassed wearing that. Um, that was hard for me to get used to, just being naked up there, because you're practically naked. Terry did end up making her desired class, lightweight. At today's competition, she's number four. She's praying to stay center stage and not be moved out toward either end of the line. Relax. That's like Siberia for a bodybuilder. We have four and five change places, four and five. And your legs dancing. Most muscular. They moved me so many times that it was a little bit confusing because I didn't know what they were doing as far as my position. Like they have four and nine change places next to each other. All right, ladies, I'd like to see one final pose before you leave the stage. This is the Women's Pro Natural Nature's Best World Championships competitors. All right, ladies, thank you very much. You can file off and we'll see the top eight to do their routines tonight. Terry is less than pleased with her performance. She won't find out until tonight whether she advances to the next round. Well, I mean, I'm beating myself up now because I know what I did wrong. I know what I did wrong, so, um, and I was cramping up a little bit up there, so it was kind of hard to hold my poses for a very long time because I was cramping up and you can't really squeeze your muscles when you're cramping because you don't want them to lock. So, you know, I did my best. I didn't hit my, uh, my poses quick enough, so I, they probably took a lot of points off of that. Uh, I'm gonna just, I need a break. Later that day, the judges announced their selections. Number 
18, number 19, number 21, number 2, number 3. Terry learns she has not advanced to the next round. All that hard work, and now she has to do it all over again for the next competition. When you work so hard and you train so hard and you know, and it doesn't happen for you. It's, it's, it's really disappointing. Like you want to kick yourself for not working harder or, or doing more. Just on the white mark for me. Oh, right there? Yeah. Normally what I try to do, especially with women who have had experiences with feeling particularly bad about where they placed, is to understand that they just need to go to the local mall and realize, based on what they're seeing, that they are, in fact, still in the 99 and 9 10th percentile of the female human race. Okay, hold it, ready? Good. They are in remarkable condition by comparison to the, to the big wide world of womanhood. After 16 weeks of hard training, Christy Hawkins and Colette Nelson have landed in Columbus, Ohio for their competition, the Miss International. How are you, man? Good, how are you? Before a big competition, female bodybuilders put themselves through an array of beauty treatments, all to achieve a look that may seem over the top to most, but one they think will work for them. Colette, you ready? Yeah. Aside from the obvious, hair, nails, and makeup, they literally airbrush their bodies from head to toe. We are trying to be on that stage at our ultimate best, and the skin tone can make or break a plaything. Might feel a little bit cold, Colette. I'm good, Because we just got it in. So I feel good, I think I look really good, I think I've got a different look, and you know, we have to go with it. I'm, I'm feeling positive about it, though. We're going to start out with a little bit of blood man moisturizer. This is always relaxing, the calm before the storm. Doing laps. Three more pieces. All right, here we go. Oh, my God. I love you. Oh, my God. This is hot. OK, am I going to be the hottest female bodybuilder up there? I mean, Yo, we are you, worse, you, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. This is a game. It's perception versus reality. You know what I mean? So it's not, you know what I mean? Wherever the flaws may be, it's all an illusion. When we come back, the question now becomes how to turn illusion into a winning performance. Here I go. Wish me luck. Will Colette's hard work pay off? Columbus, Ohio at the Miss International Contest, Christy Hawkins and Colette Nelson are about to take the stage. Here I go. Wish me luck. Christy's here with her bodybuilder boyfriend. Oh He's embarrassed. God. He doesn't want the world to know that. I respect that. Know what? <laughs> He's with a professional female bodybuilder. Wow. He'll be cheering her on in her first contest as a pro. It's just like any other bodybuilding show. They'll bring the athletes out individually. Seattle, Washington, please welcome Bruce Ragnarok. Please welcome Antoinette Thompson, Kathy Lefrancois, Diana Cadeau, and Kelly Cadeau. We'll do a little posing routine to show our strengths to the judges. From Houston, Texas, Iris Kyle. Whatever demons or insecurities or flaws a bodybuilder might have, all that has to melt away. Up here, they have to be in control, even more than in the gym. One thing that we can learn from female bodybuilders is that they, in some ways, have found an outlet for obsessional symptoms that might otherwise perhaps go into a more dangerous uh, route. It may not be all bad if someone has a very rigorous diet and exercise program. It may be saving them from symptoms that would otherwise be worse or otherwise might be more incapacitating or more dysphoric to them in one way or another. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Here comes number 13 from Pasadena, California, Christy Hawkins. 
bodybuilding has given me the chance to feel glamorous and beautiful, you know, whereas normally I would just be in the gym, no makeup on with sweats. Even though we have all this muscle, we're still very feminine and, you know, and, and attractive and real women. I think some people think that big muscles are gross, but I've heard the same thing, the same comment made about men with big muscles. There's a lot of women that think, you know, some men are too, too muscular. So it goes both ways, um, you know, and people have their own preferences and that's their right. You know, they don't have to like it. It's my body. Thank you, Here comes the queen from Dallas, Texas, Betty Pariso, number 14. When I'm looking at all the girls, and then I really am real with myself, I was like, God, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I should just stay home next year, you know? It's time to meet somebody from the Big Apple. Here comes number 11, Colette Nelson from New York, New York. I feel the most alive when I'm on stage. I become someone, something greater than life, and, and everything, all your problems, anything is gone. When you're on stage, it's like, it is like heaven. It really is. It's like being in heaven, you know? Thank you very much for that. And then they'll bring us all out together and they'll do the comparison round and go through each one and compare individual body parts. In the end, Christy and Colette do not win. They don't even place in the top six. A lesser woman might quit, but they're hooked. So defeat only fuels their fire to try even harder next time. I wanted to have a fairy tale ending. I did. I would have loved to have placed the top 10. I kind of, honestly, I felt a little bit disappointed, but it was the usual veteran competitors in the top six. Um, all of them looked tremendous. And so, um, you know, it's just going to take me a while to work up to that level, but I hope someday I can stand next to them. Me being here at the Miss International is, is almost surreal. This is coming from a little girl that was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and was told from a doctor that there are going to be things you're not going to be able to do anymore. And when I was told that, I wanted to do something that was going to prove those exact words wrong and I fell into this world of bodybuilding. I didn't even think it was possible I would ever get a pro card. When I did turn pro, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if I could step on the Miss International stage? That would be unbelievable. And I did that. Any athlete who's risen to the pro level has to be hooked. Why else would they work so hard with no guarantee of winning? Beautiful. But why muscles? Some women embrace bodybuilding for what it gives them on the surface. Yeah, like that. Bring, it, bring them down a little bit, the arms down. Yeah, beautiful. Some appreciate it for the emotional rewards they say it offers. For yet others, it's a coping mechanism that helps soothe a profound insecurity. So are they perfect specimens or just perfect candidates for the psychiatrist's couch? Maybe a little of both. Among the women competitors that we have seen, they ranged from ones who were very much in control of their lives and, and were not compromising their social or occupational function in any way with their bodybuilding lifestyle, all the way to people at the other extreme who were profoundly distressed and, and who were profoundly compromised in terms of their ability to deal with the regular world. Here's how Christy Hawkins put it in a recent email, quote, I've always admitted that you have to be a little nuts to be a good bodybuilder. But she goes on to say, there are far more destructive obsessions out there and she'll take hers over those any day. I am hooked on muscles. I mean, I, I love being strong and powerful. I love being able to move a lot of weight in the gym. It's my lifestyle and I wouldn't trade it for anything.